Hi, welcome to Christ Church. We are the Croxfords, and we will be hosting the service tonight. Whether you are here in person or online, we are so glad to be with you. Wednesday night service is such an anchor for our family, and it's really good to just be in the house of the Lord. If you want to pray during this time of worship, over here, you can come and pray by yourself. If you need prayer, we would love to pray with you over here. And now Andy is going to open us up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we get to spend together. We look forward to this every week. Uh, We're grateful for this time, and we ask that you would help us to just any distractions that we may have, that we may have brought in tonight, that you would uh, help us to lay those at your feet and help us to uh, have a peace, help us to open our hearts so that we could be receptive to your word and just to align ourselves with you. We pray that you'll be with Pastor Shane and our worship team tonight. And thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Fill every room, hey, fill every room and 
every hall. Meet us here. We need all our every day, our Monday, in every space, in every way. Cause nothing's hidden in your sight, and you bring everything to life. If we just open up our eyes, we'll see you in it, fill it up. Fill every room and every hall, and meet us here. I want more of you, God. I 
want more of you Because no place I would rather be No place I would rather be No place I would rather be But here in your love No place No place I would rather be No place I would rather be No place I would rather be
to invite you in. We continue to give you the praise to do your name. And as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings, Lord, I want you to use them, I want you to bless it. We give freely because you have. And give you all the praise. We love you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to line it up. Oh, I still messed it up. It's close enough. Hey, if you'd like to give, there are some bowls in the front or back. Thank you. If you're watching online, you can click a link. So give as you feel led. I'm going to keep singing.
I know it's not 
Our scripture reading comes from 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Take a moment to greet one another. Thank you. God is good all the time. So good to see you all tonight. Thank you for everybody that joins us online. Shout out to our CM campus and our Millstadt campus for your going deeper service. I'm just so glad that you're here with us. First Peter addresses Christians in Asia Minor who are suffering in waves of persecution from the emperor Nero. So it'll become really hot and heavy for a while. It'll let up. It'll come on. It'll let up. It'll come on. It's waves of persecution. Peter's argument has been singular. Don't make things harder than they need to be. 
Just don't do anything to make things harder than they need to be. And Peter really implores Christians to live low drama lives because there's no way to escape the cultural pushback accompanying the Christian faith in the time in which they lived. He also implies that any ill-advised actions of any Christians are gonna affect all Christians. Are you guys with me there? Any ill-advised action of any singular Christian is gonna affect the collective Christian community. I want you to imagine a group of kids playing in the woods. One finds a really cool ball hanging from a tree, has no idea what it is, decides to find a great big stick and knock it down. And then he starts poking it to see what's inside. This kid has no idea that he has just lived into the axiom, stirring up a hornet's nest. Now, when the hornets angrily emerge from the dislodged nest, looking for vengeance, they will be most indiscriminate about who they sting. In fact, every kid playing in the woods may well get stung because of the actions of one kid who can't tell a hornet's nest from a pinata. Peter is really saying to his readers, don't be that kid. Don't be that kid. Don't create problems for other people. Christians, you go poke in Caesar with a stick, we'll all pay the price for it. You ever read a post or seen a comment by someone who was a fellow Christian, maybe somebody who went to church here, and you thought, "Eh, it's not just them, that's going to blow back on all of us. We just, Peter said, "Just, just be careful about what you go poking with a stick? Verses 13 and 14. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. What, what Peter tends to do is he gets real pragmatic and then he gets theological, then he gets pragmatic and then he gets theological. Last week, I had a baseball workout with my three grandsons. Our theme was, why you don't have to be afraid of the baseball. Does anyone want to know the answer to the question? Because you will get hit. That's why you don't have to be afraid. It's not possible that you will be hit. You will be hit. And because of that, you don't have to be afraid. And I further told them that when it hits you, it will hurt. It will hurt. But you will likely survive. That's all I really had for him. Peter's logic is not dissimilar. Why don't Christians need to fear persecution? Because you will be persecuted. It is going to hit us. And though it may present unfair challenges, though it may even take our earthly lives, our eternal souls will survive. And we're going to be okay. A lot of times to really understand the promises of the Bible, you've got to somewhat untether yourself to earth. Because a lot of biblical promises aren't going to come to pass in this world. And Peter said, if you go out there and you do good, most people won't want to harm you, but some people still will. And they're going to persecute you and they may kill you. And if they do, your soul's going to be with God. And that's going to have to be good enough. There are four big ideas offered in this passage, I think, to help us navigate times of persecution, because I would argue that in America, for the rest of our lives, we're going to suffer waves of persecution as traditional Orthodox Christians. It's going to get real heavy, it'll back off, it'll get heavy, it'll back off. Have you guys ever noticed, America has a very intense but short attention span? Really intense, but really short. And so some of the things America gets really riled up about are are flat out going to point them our direction. Other things aren't. So I think we're going to need to anticipate waves of persecution. So four big ideas. Number one, doing good things shrinks our target area. 
I just say a church that does a lot of good in the community provides a counter narrative of a secular world about the church. It's a counter narrative. Number two, doing good things does not eliminate our target area. You can minimize risk, you cannot eradicate risk. So you just need to understand that. You can do everything right and things can still go wrong. I learned that playing baseball. There were times when I absolutely hit the ball as hard as I could hit it and the center fielder had to go like this to get me out. Hit a line drive right at him. There have been other times I absolutely missed the ball and clunked something in between the second baseman and the right fielder. Uh, you can do everything right and it can still go wrong. Number three, even when we are hit, persecuted, God will reward us. God will reward us. I believe there is a reward for staying faithful in persecution. I believe there is a reward for staying faithful in the really hard times in life. I believe God rewards us for that. Number four, there's no reason for worry or fear. Why? Read it with me. Because we will get hit. Hit. We don't have to be afraid of persecution. Why? Because it's going to come. It's going to come. It just is. And we don't have to fear it because it's going to be on us. We just need to prepare for it. We just need to prepare. Three or four years back, the American popular culture suddenly decided that traditional churches with biblical stands on human sexuality were haters of the worst sort. It was like you went to bed one night, a perfectly fine person, and awakened the next day to discover you were a hater. At Christ Church, we believe Christian marriage is a monogamous lifetime union between a man and a woman, and we believe in celibacy outside of marriage. These are positions we hold for choosing, for those choosing to live within the bounds of the Christian community. Always remember, teachings about Christian ethics in the New Testament weren't for everybody, they were for the church. This is how we are different than the world. Paul, in his writings, never expected Nero to behave like a Christian, but he did expect Christians not to behave like Nero. And he says, within the confines of the church, we are gonna live according to the clear and consistent teachings of scripture because we have faith to believe that is God's best plan for us. This is for insiders. Are we trying to shove this on everybody? No, this is for insiders. Regardless of what the world says, we do not hold theological positions in the church out of hate. These are positions we hold in a spirit of love. We want God's very best for all people. And we believe it is God who determines what that best is. We don't determine what is and isn't sin based on a 51% poll of the American population. God, the maker of us all, he's the one who determines those things. You see, at Christ Church, we do not believe that unconditional love necessitates unconditional approval. We're going to treat everyone really, really, really well here. Whether they agree with us or not, whether they share our beliefs or not, whether they share our practices or not, we are going to treat everybody really, really well here. But that being said, we are not backing off of the Christian ethic because we believe God's best plan for a life is according to the teachings of Scripture. And just because somebody really, 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 really wants to sin doesn't mean we have the ability to make sin okay because we love them. And that is what the secular world has never understood about the church. So we believe our best lives are lived doing things God's way, period. Is it what we always want to do right now? No. Is it always the easy thing? It's almost never the easy thing. But we do believe that there is a template, there is a guide for our lives. And it's not negotiable. 
We can accept it or we can reject it, but we don't get to modify it because we don't like it. It's just there. Jesus is who Jesus is. You can accept him, you can reject him, but you can't modify him. You can't modify him. And Jesus is who the Bible says Jesus is. And the teachings we have about how we live our lives and conduct our relationships within the church come from Scripture, not out of hate, out of love, out of a true sense of wanting the best for people. I can't tell you how many posts I read in that time period, that wave, how many messages I received during those years about how to step, how out of step we were, how awful we were. But I will tell you this, our reputation in the community helped us. Our reputation in the community helped us. We had a lot of people slandering us because we believed what Christians have believed for the last 2,000 years and all of a sudden they were slandering us for it. But you know what? Our reputation in the community really did help us. People around here have seen love and compassion and acceptance and, and good work coming from this church for decades. And that witness defended us against some of their slander. <laughs> All of it? Nope. But, but Peter never said doing good would defend you from all of the slander. He said it would filter out some of it. And it did. Theological progressives argue that traditional Christians holding our position on things like human sexuality or life are, are going to be on the wrong side of history. And I have to be very, very careful with how I say this, but I don't care what they think. I'm not concerned about being on the wrong side of history. I want to be on the right side of God because when history is no longer, God's side's still gonna prevail. Verse 15, instead, instead all that, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, Always be ready to explain it. Instead of what? Instead of living and worrying, instead of living in fear concerning persecution, instead of focusing our minds on worry, we're encouraged to focus on the worship of Jesus as the sole Lord of our lives. You know something I've become convinced of, and you, you tell me if I'm right or wrong here with you, but I don't think you can worry and worship at the same time. I think worry squelches worship and worship dispels worry. And I think as we truly learn to worship, if you could learn to worship, even if you are really, really troubled and fight a lot of battles in your emotion and in your heads, if we can really learn to worship the time we spend in worship will be the freest time of our lives. We'll be free in that moment. In those minutes, we will be free. And that's why I, I, I value worship so much because we get a, a taste of heaven. We come into union with God and in time and space in this fallen world when we truly worship and transcend where we are and truly commune with God, we get a taste of heaven. And we're free. We're free. And how many times did Jesus say he came to set us free? You want to be free? Lean into worship. I think it's a really powerful thing. I, I can recall times in my life where I was under straight up spiritual attack and, and worry threatened to overwhelm me. And I remember times in my life where the only antidote to the fear that threatened to consume me was worship. And, and I worshiped my way out of a bad place. One of the things the Bible says from time to time is that, is that God will, will give us space. Have you ever felt the whole world closing in on you? But, but there's times it says God will just, he'll just give us some space to move. And even in the worst times in my life, through worship, 
I have found a sense of space. I have found a place where I can at least go and be free for 10 minutes. And you say, what's that worth? Everything? Everything? Remember the old hymn that said, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. What beautiful prose. A foretaste of glory divine. What's worship? It's a foretaste of glory divine. When we enter worship, we are freer than we will ever be on this side of heaven. And finally, Peter's church is encouraged to think about the content of their witness should they be asked. And why would someone ask? Because people know they're being persecuted and they see how well they're holding up underneath it. Imagine someone saying to you, I I, I notice that you're different than everybody else here. You work where we all do and yet you seem to have joy. You experience the same stressors we all do and yet you seem to have a sense of peace what why is that what do you have what would you tell them what would you tell them I want to suggest the more thought you put into that now the more effective your witness will be when the time comes I think the discipline of writing out a 250 Word, which is kind of like one page testimony, and kind of getting that thing down, or maybe videoing a three minute personal testimony in response to this question would be a great place to start. So imagine someone asks you, Why are you different? I see something different in you. Why is that? What would you say? I, I think it would serve us well to put some thought into that. There are times in the Bible it says don't worry about what to say because the Spirit will tell you what to say, right? This isn't one of them. (laughs) Yes, in one of them. 16, 17. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good if that's what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. How we say a thing is at least as important as what we say. People can't hear the right thing if it's presented the wrong way. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody either direction where the essential substance was entirely missed due to the spirit of the delivery? And maybe that conversation could have been really fruitful it's just, it got so cross started and twisted that it, it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, I think this is why difficult conversations need to never see a text or an email. Because if something can be taken the wrong way, it will be. And I, I think difficult conversations need to either be held by phone where at least somebody can hear your voice or better yet, in person. But I think these are important things. And if you have to have a difficult conversation, you should at least think as much about how you're going to say it as what you're going to say. You ever see somebody that just spends all their time in what they're going to say, and then they don't think about how they say it, and then it just comes out in such a way no human could possibly hear it. No human living on the earth could possibly receive that information. So... I think that's a really great thing to think about. So let's kind of divide our personal witness into content and spirit of delivery, okay? So you got content, what we're gonna say, and then how are we gonna say it? If you really wanna put people off, you just come off like you're better than them. Boy, anything you say after an air of superiority, you just turn into an adult in a Charlie Brown special after that. Nobody's going to be able to understand you. Nobody's listening after that. Delivery matters. Many years ago, I was on an NGL evangelistic outreach, the Indianapolis 500, as I recall. I was in charge of a group that particular year. I had a young professional street preacher placed in my group who was trained by the legendary street preacher, Jed Smock. Now, back in those days, there were a handful of these campus slash street preacher guys around 
And most of them were some combination of evangelism, apologetics, and public entertainment. Uh, these guys were really good, and they were really sharp, and it was really fun to, to listen to them. Uh, among their ranks was a guy named Herbert Hubert Lindsay, who they called Holy Hubert. Holy Hubert was a colleague of my dad, a contemporary of my dad. He wore a Hell's Angels vest everywhere he went because he converted a Hell's Angel. The guy gave him his vest, and Holy Hubert wore, wore that vest for the rest of his life everywhere he went. And Holy Hubert was famous for banter. So he'd get in there with the crowd, and they'd just start going back and forth. And it'd be stuff like this. Hey, Hubert, God made marijuana. Why don't you smoke it? And Hubert would say, God made poison ivy. Why don't you chew it? And it all kind of went along those kind of lines. But you kind of get the idea. It was kind of playful, and, and there was some back and forth, and then every now and then things would go bad. And Holy Hubert told my dad and his colleagues, if they start beating me up, you, you leave them alone because when God strikes them, he'll strike you too. So it's kind of interesting. Well, most of these guys were playful, witty, entertaining, but this guy in my group, he was just plain mean. <laughs> he was young and he was mean. And when it was his turn to take the microphone, he, he castigated everyone within the sound of his voice. He was calling people horrible names and and. I mean, it was just so utterly abrasive. And pretty soon, more than a few people in the crowd were fired up and pushing in. And all that stood between Captain Abrasive and an increasingly angry crowd was like eight or ten guys that were in my group. And they were all looking at me like, what do we do? And I didn't even have to pray about that one. You ever have something you didn't even have to pray about? I said, here's the deal, guys. I'm not going to get beat up because this guy's an idiot. God will either protect him or he won't, but we're leaving. So we just left. And I think that's kind of the thing when we operate in the flesh. We're just on our own. We're just on our own. When we share faith, we must never allow the manner with which we say a thing diminish the content of what we're trying to say. How? You say things matters a lot. So how should we offer our witness in times of persecution? Uh, Peter gives us three things. Number one, gently. Gentle means you have the capacity to really tear things up, but you choose not to. A bear can be gentle, a mouse can be meek, but a mouse can't be gentle. To be gentle, you have to have the capacity to tear things up. A gentle witness is a witness where we are committed to doing no harm. It's a restrained witness. It's a witness in love so gently number two respectfully tone of voice not being condescending listening not talking the whole time giving serious consideration to questions and simply being polite are ways that we show respect to other people and we don't control the discourse we, we don't control the narrative as Christians we are one voice in a culture full of voices and sometimes the price we pay for being heard is listening and I think if we're really going to be effective witnesses, we're going to have to be as willing to listen as we are to talk. And when we talk, we're going to need to have something to say. And then it says, with a clear conscience. This, this means not having things to regret when the interchange is completed. How many of you, like if you had a really bad conversation that just went south with somebody, how many of you would run that over in your head maybe 8,000 times? Would you raise your hands? Yeah, well, this is, this is don't have a witness and put yourself in a position to have to do that. This means not having things to regret. You don't want to share your faith and then think, man, I wish I had said this, or worse yet, I wish I hadn't said that. And I think that's why Peter tells us, put some time into your testimony. You know? Uh, let me tell you two words that never need to come up in your testimony. Democrat, Republican. <laughs> Those be a couple words that don't really need to come up in your testimony. It's just good to think about some of those things. I'm not an avid deer hunter in, in the sense that others in my life are, but I do have strong enthusiasm around annual deer hunting weekends. In fact, if it wasn't for the deer hunting proper, I'd have a better time. Melissa and Zach are the true hunters in our family, and 
they'll both tell you one thing. You often only get one shot at a deer, and you can be out days and days and days, and you may just get one shot. And often, that shot comes, that opportunity comes when you least expect it. Last year, Melissa and Zach decided to walk into a hunting area together. You say, well, where were you, Shane? Might have been at McDonald's drinking coffee. <laughs> and before they could even unpack Melissa's stuff, this big buck appeared right in front of them. If you guys have ever deer hunted, they can just come out of nowhere, and you just don't see them, and you just kind of, you just came out of nowhere. Well, fortunately, they both had their guns loaded, though they weren't unpacked. Melissa shot, Zach shot. Melissa turned to Zach and said, what in the world just happened? Well, what happened is that deer's head will be spending the next few decades mounted on my cabin wall above the fireplace. So it's a bad day for the deer. But Faith Sharon's a lot like that. A lot of times, you're only going to get one shot to share your faith with somebody. So you really do well to be prepared. You just do well to be prepared. And, and I, I like the way the King James translates. It, it says, have an answer for the hope that is within you. So if you did get a chance to share a witness, what would you say? Well, pastor, you're telling me that we should practice it? Oh, that's a great idea. It's a great idea. Just find somebody and go back and forth practicing, sharing your witness, talk about it. But have an answer for the hope that is within you. Peter is fully aware that being a, a witness for Christ in a time of persecution will lead us into trouble. It's, it's inevitable. Peter was well aware that some of the people reading this letter would be thrown out of their families. Some would become cultural pariahs. Some would lose their jobs. Not a ton of them would go to prison, and if so, they wouldn't stay very long because, if I, as I've said before, deep in the heart of the Romans, they didn't think people should get free room and board just because they couldn't behave themselves. So they tended not to throw you in jail very long. They were just going to beat the daylights out of you and let you go, or they were going to execute you. But they weren't going to sit around and feed you indefinitely. Some of these Christians lost their lives, though. Uh, I think it's entirely likely Peter was martyred by Nero within a year of the writing of First Peter and Second Peter. I, I, think, I, I think he probably died the same year. Peter wants his readers to make sure that when the ball hits them, and it will, it's hitting them because they were wisely and prudently sharing their faith under the influence of the Holy Spirit and not because they couldn't tell the difference between a hornet's nest and a pinata. Now, as we've become accustomed to seeing Peter do, he's again going to follow these practical instructions with some theological underpinnings and what I'm going to call a theology of the persecuted. So let's take a look at this theology of the persecuted. Verse 18, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So let's look at five components of a theology for the persecuted. Number one, the cross was one time for all time. It happened. It will never have to happen again. It got the job done. The cross of Jesus Christ is sufficient, is sufficient to cover all of our sin, past, present, future. It is sufficient. No more is needed than the cross of Jesus Christ. Number two, Jesus never sinned. This throws us back into Judaism. In Judaism, a lamb without spot or blemish, a perfect lamb, was sacrificed annually on the Day of Atonement for the sins of the people. In Christianity, the sacrifice of Jesus is a once and for all sacrificial lamb. You don't need to do this every year, once and for all. Jesus was the perfect lamb. What he did, only he could do, and it will never have to be done again. So here's what I want you to hear. No matter how bad you think your sin is, 
It is not stronger than the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ is more than enough, more than enough to take care of the sin in our life. We don't need more than that. The price for your sin has been paid by Christ. Number three, Jesus died to bring sinners safely home to God. Think about uh, baseball's too light there, but war's not. You know, the objective of a soldier is not to be comfortable, it's to accomplish the mission of a nation. But you really do hope that soldiers do come home. And, and what he's really saying here is that through Christ, the forgiveness of our sin, it'll get us home to God. We don't need anything else in addition to receiving what Christ has done. So you don't have to crawl up 50 flights of stairs. You don't have to jog to the moon and sprint back. You don't have to, to pay somebody to do something. The cross is sufficient. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient once and for all for our sins. Nothing else is needed. It gets the job done. It will bring us safely home to God for it takes care of our sin. All we have to do is ask for forgiveness and receive what is already there. Number four. Jesus died physically. This is a reoccurring theme. So let me put this in my language. Jesus wasn't deadish. He was dead. Can I use the Southern Illinois axiom? Deader than a doornail. He was completely dead. He was without life. So he died on that cross. But number five, he arose to life. Jesus was not alive-ish. After the resurrection, he is alive. And these are really important issues for the early church. Some people say, well, does it really matter if Jesus literally resurrected? Yes. If Jesus didn't re literally resurrect, all we have is a religion among other religions, a philosophy among other philosophies, a way of living among, among other ways of living. What distinguishes Christianity is the virgin birth, the perfect life, the willing sacrifice on the cross that led to his death, his placement in the tomb, and his resurrection from the dead. That is what differentiates us. It's the only tomb in the world you go look at to see who isn't there. And that is what makes us unique. And those are really important things. So what did Jesus do after the resurrection? Verses 19 through 21. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed God long ago when Noah waited patiently, while God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not by the removing of dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you first read that, you think, man, we need to get into the original language to clear that up. This is the cleared up version of the original language. So I just need you to know that this passage is functionally impossible to unravel. It's just functionally impossible to unravel, but at its heart, I think it's pretty clear. It makes a claim to the nature of the ministry of Christ and to baptism as a seal of that ministry so let's just unpack what we can pull out of the suitcase and i'm just going to tell you right now it's not much uh, history has been described as a guitar string with one pole inserted into creation the other into the second coming of christ and anywhere you pluck the string the string reverberates in every direction are you guys with me anywhere you pluck the string it reverberates in every direction so too was the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Peter is making a point. It's not just for now, but it was also for back then. And it's also for every soul that lives until Christ returns. So in ways we cannot comprehend, the work needed for our salvation 2,000 years later, and even the work of Christ in times before reverberated both directions 
somehow it impacted that. You say, can you be a little clear? Nope, that's all I got. <laughs> the Genesis flood is a baptism of death, bringing destruction to the wicked. It's kind of water gone bad. Jewish pur purifications were a baptism of the body to wash off the dirt before approaching a holy space. Christian baptism is a death to self and a resurrection to new life. It's God's official seal on us. We are sealed in water. So to sum things up, <laughs> you think this is terrible. Oh, it's even worse. To sum things up, it appears that after the resurrection, what did Jesus do? It appears that he ran down Satan and settled some old scores going back to Noah. He cleaned up some of the mess that Satan had made and generally gave him what we used to call a butt whooping. And beyond that, we're just going to have to play that that's what it says and just move on card. <laughs> so, to sum things up, it appears that after the resurrection, uh, business was conducted that ran backward and frontward and in the time. And I think it kind of gets to passages in the Bible where it says, praise be to God who, who was and is and is to come. All right? We're so linear. And one of the real problems I think we run into is we want Jesus and the gospel to fall into human logic. And my question is real simple. How can human logic contain an infinite God? How could the finite contain the infinite? It's folly. So God is not restrained to our logic. Not everything God does is going to make sense to us because we just aren't that smart. But Peter has a spiritual insight here. Something happened we're probably not going to fully understand. And I hate to say this, the more I got into it, the less I understood it. I understood it a lot better the first time I read it. <laughs> and sometimes we do that. But now we get to verse 22. Home stretch. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and power accept his authority. This can be summed up in the phrase, Jesus is Lord. At this time, the Roman Empire, residents of Asia Minor, as a sign of loyalty to the empire, were expected to go before a magistrate once a year, kind of sign off, take a pinch of incense, throw it in a little flame, and say, Caesar is Lord. It was a little thing. If you did that, you could basically do anything. Christians wouldn't do it hard pass and Peter said you know when it comes to something like that, that that's where you're going to have to get in trouble <laughs> you know that's where you're going to have to get in trouble that's, that's, that's where we're going to have to get at it when it comes to stuff like that this meant that people in the empire subjected themselves totally and completely to the dominion of the emperor Nero you know Nero not shockingly, Christians not only took a hard pass, but at times they would go before the emperor or before the magistrate, they would sign off, they would take a pinch of incense, and before they threw it in the flame, guess what they said? Jesus is Lord. And then you stood there, and you're just going to have to wait and see what happened. Peter's reminding his persecuted church that Jesus has everything in control. Kurt Warner was the quarterback of the greatest show on turf back before Rams went extinct in St. Louis. When the Rams let Warner go, my affections followed him to the Giants and later to the Arizona Cardinals where he made a comeback that kind of sealed his Hall of Fame career. And during this period of time... Uh, I, I followed the Cardinals and, and Warner closely. Uh, during this period of time, when the Cardinals would play on Sunday afternoons, which was what? Every game during football season, except one Monday, maybe? 
I, I always have, had meetings all day on Sundays. And I never got to watch games, but I would always tape the games. And then I would hope all day that nobody told me what the score was. I mean, seriously, I would tape the games and then hope all day nobody told me what the score was. And one Sunday, I almost made it to my car. And, and somebody yelled out, hey, Shane, Cardinals won! And I'm thinking, terrible, terrible. So then I had to decide, am I going to watch the game or not? And I decided, I'm, I'm still going to go watch the game. So I went home and watched the recorded game, and I was surprised to find out the Cardinals were behind the entire game. I mean, they were behind the entire game, and Warner was not brilliant. Lots of bad things happened that game. And every time the Cardinals made a mistake, every time they got behind by a score or two, I was just fine. I mean, normally if I was watching that game, I would have gone up and down, been excited, you know. I would have felt all kinds of emotions. No matter how bad things went for the Arizona Cardinals and Kurt Warner, it didn't bother me at all. You want to know why? Because the outcome of the game had already been determined. I knew that by the time it all shook down, the Cardinals were going to win because I already knew they won the game. I didn't have to be stressed despite the fact things weren't looking good because I knew the game had already been determined. Here's the deal. Jesus wins. And because we know that, we do not have to live in fear and anxiety regardless of the trials and tribulation and even persecution that may be bearing down upon us. And why do we not have to live in fear? Because we will get hit but the outcome of the game has already been determined. Oh God, He is so good. Oh God, He is so good. Oh God, He's so good, He's so good to me. We sing it again. Oh, and God, He's so good, yes, He is. Oh God, He's so good. We believe that God. Thank you so much for the time that we got to spend in your house tonight, worshiping together. Uh, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the healing that you've brought to us. We pray that you would be with us this week as we go out into the world and show your light to others. We pray all these, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.